Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Business Today. I'm Jerome Paul Sonko, and this is Smart24 TV. Welcome to the Night Bulletin. But first, let's have a look at the headlines. All right, now let's get right into what we have for you tonight. We start with the Ugandan exports after yesterday's President Exports Awards. In the past, Uganda would only export traditional crops like coffee and cotton. Now, there is a variety like tourism, electricity, services and many more. During the Uganda Export Promotion Board, uh, the Minister of State for Trade, Industry and Cooperatives, David Bahati, says that, uh, say that Uganda has grown from 100 million US dollars to 4.5 billion US dollars. Pedison Mumbere reports. Uganda Export Promotion Board facilitates exporters and the general public to access foreign markets and more importantly encourages the business community to export. Thank you for facilitating and supporting the Uganda Export Promotions Board in the mobilization of practitioners for the development of the IT and ITES sector. Let's give them a big hand clap as they come for doing an incredible job. During the Uganda Export Promotion Board Awards, the Minister of State for Trade, Industry and Cooperatives, David Bahat, held the export champions for their contribution towards the development of the export sector, saying that Uganda has shoot up from 100 million US dollars to 4.5 billion US dollars. We are now focusing on import substitution and export promotion. In 1986, right from Prime Minister, the export volume for Uganda was just in the region of 100 million US dollars. But we are glad that now, as we speak, our export level is now 4.5 billion US dollars. And this export volume is not because of government, it's because of people who are seated in this room, working long and hard to make sure that we grow our exports. So we are here to thank you and to appreciate you and deserve a very big hand clap. Mine cannot be enough to appreciate you. Great strides in managing the pandemic and getting the country, the, getting the economy back on track. That is why we are here today. I urge you to continue taking all necessary precautions and measures to keep yourself, families, and friends safe. COVID 19 is still a threat. As I have been, as I have mentioned in my various speeches, Uganda's economy has remained resilient despite the several challenges. The economy continues to expand, especially with proliferation of the industrial and services sector. Uganda today has more to export. The third Deputy Prime Minister, Rukia Nakadama, representative of the His Excellency, the President of Uganda, Yoweri Museveni, at the awards, extended the President's sincere gratitude towards exporters in both public and private sectors for pushing the country to the middle income status as it was read in the budget speech. Uganda now has the Uganda Airlines, which recently has been granted landing rights in countries like China, which will largely help boost Uganda's exportation rate. Thank you so much. When the president was, uh, when you were reading the budget speech, he said Uganda has joined the middle income status countries. And we thank you people for that. As government, we are also trying to work hard to see that the percentage that had lagged behind, that is the 39%, 
we see we were trying we are trying our best to see that they also join the money economy and that's why ministers members of parliament right now are in the field we have gone back to our constituencies to see that we popularize our parish development model Several stories have been shared regarding failure by many Ugandan entrepreneurs to meet demand for various goods from external markets. Reports from the Uganda Export Promotion Board shows that the major challenges has been production for quantities instead of quality for the export markets. However, there is a saying that for a company to successfully and consistently meet the demands of the foreign buyers, it must focus on three things which include the quality, quantity, and sustainability of the production. The T category by MacLeod Russell, Uganda Limited. Pedson Mumbere, Smart 24 TV, Business Today. All right, now with the details of that particular one, now we move to the Ministry of Internal Affairs as the Immigrations Department under the Ministry of Internal Affairs has been in the spotlight for the delays in the issuance of passports with many Ugandans bitter with the tedious processes that have meant the delivery of immigration services unbearable. The department has been alive to the complaints from the public. They serve with unending explanations of when the services will be better. Now, Mutumba brings you the latest from the department responsible for immigration services in Uganda. And here is our story. Early last year, the Ministry of Internal Affairs announced it will be phasing out the current passports for the modern East African e-passports and resorted to online applications. In response to the public challenges, the Ministry of Internal Affairs is planning a call center dedicated to the service of the public anytime. This will speed the process that have been widely viewed as breeding corruption, among others. Ministry has launched a call center to improve its communication with the public. Hello, good morning. <laughs> Ministry responsible for facilitating legal and order the movement of persons to and from Uganda and regulating residents of immigrants in the country. We also are responsible for verifying and processing Ugandan citizenship and enforcing national and regional immigration laws for the development and security of Uganda. We are always looking out for ways of serving the public better. Our ultimate objective is to have seamless service for our clients who are vast. It includes all Ugandans, all Ugandan citizens, and some non-Ugandans. It's a very simple function, is to invite uh, the permanent secretary to make his remarks and officially uh, declare the call center open. Uh, before I do that, I'll just say that this is something that we have been procrastinating on for quite some time. Uh, clients, people generally, have been asking a lot of questions related to the immigration services that we offer, as in uh, passports, related to visas, related to work permits, and so on. And it has been difficult for them to, to get appropriate uh, responses and answers. So we are looking at this call center to be able to respond uh, to people's queries in a timely and in an effic efficient manner. One would be able to call in and find out exactly what the status of their application uh, with the adequate response from the appropriate immigration officer. So we're looking forward for this as uh, a government uh, achievements in terms of responding to people's, um, uh, people's uh, requirements. We've been initiating some, we have been taking initiatives to improve the service that we provide you. Previously, we introduced online innovations such as the e-passport and the e-visa, where applications are made online for either the passport or the visa. And these have tremendously lessened the bureaucracy and the red tape for applicants seeking passport services, immigration services, and, and visas, respectively. 
while doing away with, by implementing this, we are reducing the human to human contact. And you know, the less human to human contact you have, the, the less likely you, you, you are, less likely you are going to have some kind of corruption. So these initiatives are aimed at reducing whatever corrupt tendencies that the public is always crying about. And these services help us also to get immediate feedback. The call center is store free, meaning there is no cost for anybody calling, calling and asking questions. So you can call for no cost to internal affairs, and you make any inquiries about the Ministry of Internal Affairs. We know there are many inquiries about passports, the passport process, many inquiries about visas, but for Ugandans, it's mainly the passports and the stage at which the applications are. And this toll-free line will be able to answer those questions. As the PRO has said, these are the numbers 0800199003 and 0800199004. So you can call these numbers anytime, 24 hours. Naomi Mtumba, Business Today, Smart 24, Driving Business. Well, moving on away from that, let's head to South Sudan as the government launched the Uganda South Sudan Business Forum, which will raise awareness about the investment opportunities in both countries. Both countries are to hold their first joint business forum with the theme enhancing bilateral trade and investment through industrialization and infrastructure development, which is scheduled to take place in Juba, South Sudan, from 19th to the 21st of July, 2022. Babu Isa with the report. It's the launch briefing with the two member states, Uganda's envoy for South Sudan, Brigadier General Rooney Balia, highlighted the objectives of this forum. Platform that allows the Uganda and South Sudan private sectors to identify opportunities and challenges of cross-border trade and investment. Create business-to-business -business networks and share experiences. To establish a Uganda-South Sudan Joint Business Forum. Three, to raise awareness about investment and business opportunities in both countries. Four, to boost bilateral trade and investment flow. Five, to showcase the Uganda and South Sudan private sectors through a business exhibition. Ambassador Roni stipulates the main opportunities as one of Uganda's largest trading partners. Ugandans should venture in South Sudan as the country is still developing and young. Infrastructure, real estate, oil and gas are all opportunities for Ugandans to tap in. Encourage the Uganda business community to engage in joint venture with South Sudan business community in, for example, agri-based industries, hospitality industry, hotels, real estate, accommodation is very expensive in, in Juba and outside Juba, very expensive. You find a house going at $10,000 a month, a small house, three-bedroom house, $10,000, $8,000. You can get it in Kampala at $2,000. Now, five times here. It's very expensive. Juba is very expensive. Accommodation is very expensive. We have over 30 hotels in Juba here. But they are full all the time. They are full. They are full. You move around, you see. You see. Okay, now 
The government of Uganda has signed an agreement with Greedworks at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Chigali. The deal has excited Uganda's energy experts that will be the first of its kind to use private investment to support the development of Uganda's transmission sector. Let's have more of this report. Greedrox is a development and investment platform founded and fully owned by British International Investment. It was founded in 2019, established with a mandate to provide capital to develop on and off grid electricity transmission and distribution infrastructure across Africa. A partner to government, utilities, and companies in the energy sector, Greedrox aims to connect Africa's people and its businesses to reliable and affordable power. Ruth Nankavirwa, Uganda's Minister of Energy and Mineral Development, welcomed the agreement and said it is a pleasure to announce a pilot project with Gridworks that will bring new private investment to Uganda's transmission sector. Nankabira said on the sidelines of the ongoing Commonwealth meeting in Kigali, Rwanda, that Uganda wants to promote self-reliable and sustainable electricity supply and facilitate stable regional electricity trade. By increasing investment in her electricity grid, Uganda will be able to unlock suppressed demand, boost industrialization, and power her export sector. Simon Simon Hodson, the CEO of Gridworks, said they what he called the forward-thinking Ugandan government to deliver the country's first privately financed transmission project. Transmission infrastructure is essential for economic growth, electricity access, sustainable power networks, and a green energy transition. Their pilot project has taken several years to develop and will demonstrate that this model can be used to under critical projects. It will benefit households and businesses in Uganda and ensure that high-quality renewable power is available to drive economic development. There's a huge need for funding of Africa's electricity networks. That need will be met more quickly by creating sustainable business models that attract private sector capital and expertise. All right, that's Miriam Monbete with the details. Now let's move to business in hide and skins in Uganda. Have you been wondering why the prices of leather products is growing every day? Uh, wonder no more because Winnie Naka, which is giving you an insightful report about the closure of Uganda's only hides and skins processing factory. The Uganda leather and tanning industry, which has humbled the country to a mere importer of skins and no more a producer of quality processed leather. This has hindered the growth of the industry and local factories are deprived of byproducts that could be put to other uses. Uganda had one factory in Jinja that collapsed a decade ago, leaving traders with no option but to import from Kenya with high taxes. As we are using from Uganda, some of them from Kenya, some of them from Ethiopia. But these days we buy them from Kenya, mostly. Uh, being that our ma, our factory, which was making our leather in Jinja, stopped some time back. But now we are getting this leather from Kenya. Currently, hides are mainly used for footwear, belts, and other leather goods. The current price of leather products depends on the type, with the lowest square feet of processed leather going to 70,000. Dealers are reporting a sharp fall in profit margins by 70%. The leather depends on the, on the grade and the type. Like this type, the kips, it has three grades. It has that one which comes in square feet. You know leather is measured in square feet. It has that one that comes in kilograms. So we must bring that one in kilograms and that one in square feet. In square feet, uh, the price is was 6.5 but right now it's 7,000. Uh, then this, the blacker one, the price is 6,000 per square feet because leather is measured in square feet that determines the price of our products. So when the dollar increases, even our products increases, uh, the dollars matches with the Kenya money. When the dollar raises, even Kenya money, money raises. Before COVID, the prices were fair. By these days, prices has gone up. So we have increased the price, but still, customers are very few because of the prices. The country needs a factory for natural leather processing, according to dealers. 
Out of the five major tanning industries, it's only the ginger-based leather industries of Uganda that processes hides and skins up to finished product stage, ready for use in the local market. It's however closed and is affecting business in hides and skins. Winnie Nakauchi, Naomi Mtumba, Business Today, Smart 24, Driving Business. Well, small and medium-sized enterprises or fishers are wondering how the government intends to collect up to the increased URA target against the declaration that no new taxes were introduced in the new financial year. Will this likely see an increase in the current taxes or what is the government's plan? Fred Makubia, this time round, is with the president, the Federation of Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises, John Walugembe, and he's giving us more in the coffee court tonight on this matter. Well, thank you, Jordan Paulson. Tonight in our coffee court, we discuss the future of SMEs. We are joined by the president of Federation of Small and Medium Enterprise, Mr. Morgan Kabunguru. Of course, he will be sharing with us his perspective on the future of SMEs, but also most importantly, come the next financial year. URA has not increased taxes but the target has increased. What does this mean, especially in the future? Of SMEs, uh, Mr. Walgembe, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Mm -hmm. The new financial year is coming to, to the start, but first and mm -hmm. foremost, mm -hmm. what, what, what is the current status of SMEs in Uganda? The current status of SMEs is that they are still on the road to recovery since the uh, outbreak of the global pandemic mm -hmm. in March. 2020 and the closure of this economy. Now, since the full reopening of the economy, we've seen a lot of sectors pick up, we've seen economic activity pick up, we've seen optimism pick up in particular sectors of the economy. In others, there's still sluggish growth. Uh, the recovery has somehow been uh, moderated by the current high inflation and high commodity prices. Mm -hmm. So this creates a certain level of uncertainty with regard to how the economy will fare as a whole. Mm -hmm. Because that, the high commodity prices directly impact on the cost of production. They also directly impact on the consumption power okay. of consumers and their willingness to spend. So all these things create a certain level of uncertainty, but overall, I would say that we are in a much better state okay. than during the lockdown, for instance. When does the uncertainty expect to end as a person behind It's this? difficult. It's difficult. Uh, the current inflation is what I would call imported inflation. It's due to external shocks. Mm -hmm. We have the war in Ukraine. We have the disruption of global supply chains. That is not helped by the fact that some economies are still partially locked down. Okay. You know, so this will take some time, and I don't think I'm in a position to reliably estimate yeah. when things will weather out, but we hope for the best, and we hope that uh, things will start getting better soon. Okay. Mm. Let's now widen our lenses. New financial year, mm. new target, big target for URA. Mm. And there are no new taxes introduced. What's the implication of this? No, I think that is smart in such a situation where you have you're dealing in a what I would call kind of a crisis situation. It's if you increase taxes uh, and introduce new tax measures, one you co you increase the uncertainty. Remember, when investors are coming here, or domestic or foreign, by the way. They try to look, ex look at the business environment as some of the issues they consider is the tax regime. So the tax regime cannot be continually changing, it cannot be a moving target. Mm -hmm. There has to be a certain level of predictability. So I think what the Ministry of Finance has done to say, look, we have certain taxes, let's just consolidate, let's improve compliance, let's make sure that we improve their performance. I think that's a wise move. Um, obviously, I don't think it was wise to increase the overall um, target. target, 
yeah, you know, in any case, I would kind of cut it by looking at areas of wastage, you know, but be, that, be, be it as it may, this money now has to be collected and yeah, you see. But the target is increasing the new taxes. I see that as a, no, the, the maybe a contradiction. No, it's not a contradiction at all. The government has said they are going to try to plug the leakages mm. by improving compliance. So they want more people to pay the existing taxes. Just introducing new taxes does not result in new money, you know? You no, know, if, if you introduce a tax and people don't pay, then next time introduce a tax and people don't pay, what's the use? Because remember, a budget is just a system of what you hope. You know, to but but it's, a, it's a guiding document. It's a guiding document, true, but it's just an estimate. So let, let us see how improve uh, how government can reach resource based through improving compliance. My worry is that they need to take cognizance of the fact that businesses are being negatively affected both by the pandemic mm. and by the current high levels of inflation, which I fear might slowly evolve into a recession. Okay. Yeah. So, the SMEs, what does this now mean to the SMEs, especially those that, just, that are just starting up this? What it means is that you're operating in a hard environment, so you have to really make sure that you have made your calculations well. You know? In such a context, it's not good to be over-optimistic, it's good to be realistic. You know? How many people buy your product? Don't start by assuming that a whole village will buy your product. Because people are either poor, or they don't want to spend, or they are worried, so they are trying to keep their cash with them. So as you're making your projections, mm. try to be as realistic as you can do. So in the long run, if that is put into consideration. Anyway, let's now shift gears to the new model, which we call the parish model. I know every, everyone holds uh, different opinions about it. You, you take as a, as a as No, my as take a, is that it's a good model in the sense that you're trying to support 3.5 million households that are stuck in subsistence agriculture to get into the money economy. Okay. okay. Uh, if we know that each parish is going to be given 100 million shillings, you know, that you know will be used to support you know some of uh, these activities and improve access to credit and so on. Okay. Government is also trying to ensure that there's a lot, there's good data collection at that level, at the parish level, which is good. Okay. So I would say that the idea is good. Will it be put into implementation? Just writing a good idea does not mean that you have achieved your goal. But it's a good starting point. It's a good starting point, but how do we self-congratulate before we do? We assess how we are implementing because this is the second year of its implementation. So what I'm saying is, I think let's concentrate on making sure that we deliver what we promised, as opposed to keeping on sharing theories. This is what we want to do. This is what we want to do. You do it. Then we can judge you based on what you've been able to deliver or not deliver. So that's that's my view really. I think the model is good. It seeks to help people who have been stuck in subsistence agriculture. As to whether it addresses all the constraints that have kept those people there is another question. Okay. Yes, people, that can be discussed academically, but now that this is in the budget, money has been allocated, I think the right thing to do is get on with it. 100 million per parish. 100 million. Is this worth enough? To such it's not time? enough. It's not enough, but it's what is available. And I think if the money is not misappropriated, or the money is not misdirected to use these things, it can do something. What may hinder this model from your perspective? As a what may hinder this model is if we don't learn lessons from what has failed to work in the past. If we just replicate, they call it business as usual. Mm. That may be a hindrance. Two is if we allow this model to be run by government officials primarily. because. Economic activity is done by private people. You know? So if you don't involve them sufficiently, and if you allow it to be government-led, then there is a trap you might fall into. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you can't separate government. No, we are not How saying we should it? separate government. We are simply saying government should carve out its role and do it well and allow other actors to do their role. Okay. 
the government should not seek to do everything. Yeah. Should not seek to create groups. You know, yeah, I mean, government should do it so and do it excellently well. Okay. W what is the role of SMEs in driving this kind of model? To the SMEs things? are critical because SMEs are already economic actors. You cannot say, I'm pulling X from poverty without understanding this man who set up his own business and has pulled himself. What did he do right? So this model must first understand which SMEs are thriving. Why are they thriving? How can they be a pull factor to others? Mm. You know? Government cannot pull people into economic activity, you know. It has to be people that those of 3.5 million households can identify with. Mm. You know? So that, 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 that is their role, and I think it's up to the parishes, it's up to the uh, secretariat, you know, to craft a strategy that ensures that it engages all the actors, not just SMEs, farmers, and so on. Engage them. So just giving them money, would it be enough? No, giving them money is not good. You no, know, because that is a business as usual, as I'm telling you. You cannot throw money at problems and they go away. Mm. Yes. But it partly solves the problem. Well, money should be there to fund a concrete idea. Money is not the start and end of everything. You know? These people are not poor because they have they lack access to money. You know, maybe they get the money, but they don't spend it twice. You know? So for me, the issue is how do we... Um, for me, the issue is how do we ensure that this money is not squandered through limited preparation? Just, I think we have to also give credit to the framers because they, in there they put a, a component of business development services. Mm -hmm. How do you capacitate actors with skills and competencies and so on? I think that's, that's a good um, divergence for okay. previous programs. What could kill the model from your perspective as a president of I've already highlighted what can kill the model. If you allow government to dominate, you know, if you don't pick lessons from what hasn't worked, you know, if you if you if you think that this is a silver bullet to every problem, you know, because there are other problems that may have kept those people where they are, and those problems have to be solved. The parish model won't make them go away. So how do you also keep resolving those problems as you implement the parish development. So I think it's not, from my personal perspective, I think we need to give the implementers time so that we assess them based on work done. Mm -hmm. At the moment, I think we are, we are rotating, we are bordering on speculation. No, but the money is already put in the financial year, which is coming, 2022, 2023. That's, that's it's already safe. <laughs> that's it's true. not a speculation. <laughs> It's already money. No, the money is there, but okay. how it will work in practice is what we don't know now. You know? So I'll be happy if we had this conversation probably eight months from now. Yeah. Which we will. Which so we that will. we now look at a report card. You know? Do you have fillers in which parishes? There are 10,000. You know? Can we do a survey? Maybe in 500 parishes. How are they doing? How many jobs have been created? How many people have entered economic activity? Or they have spent all their money in transport allowance and meetings and so on. So. But a good leader is one who may anticipate and look at the future. True. I have given my position. Our position is that it's a good idea. You know, we cannot start shooting down ideas before we see them you know, executed. So it's a good idea. It seeks to solve uh, a real problem. The issue now is how do you implement it in such a way that it's effective. You said it's a good idea that seems to address the real problem. What are the core problems? From your experience that you think SME is? No, so this model really is not, the main target is not the SMEs per se. It's the other 3.5 million people. Well, there might be SMEs to the extent that engage in informal Mm, which part will play the 38 percent? The 38 percent. But the, the, the about. issue is, you have people who are engaged in the growing of 
products that are not linked to market. They just grow food, they eat it, they stay. Why don't they sell to market? One, there may not be demand. If people are not willing, you cannot supply what is not demanded. Two, there may be difficulty getting these things to the market. Maybe the roads are poor. Government has done a lot to address this constraint, this sectors. They could be the fact that they are unschooled. This is all they know. Digging, sleeping, digging, sleeping. It might be that they don't have the right attitude to life. They are demotivated. Which I think this could be your core as their president to address. My president, <laughs> my, my role, really, as I see it, is how do we support SMEs to go? These people are still at home and in their beds. I wait for them to start a business, then I see how to help them. We call them the active poor. If you are poor and inactive, no, you are not paid. Because, you, because you are the voice of the voiceless. Is <laughs> of the you you speak for true. those that do that's not, true. Do not that's have true. any voice. And that's why I'm saying, let the SMEs be involved in supporting their friends to get out of work. They have the experience. In Kalido, the person who has started a business is the best place to help others who haven't started. You see? In Pade, because the context in Pade and the context in Kalido may not be the same. May not be the same. Yes. So use those local businesses. Find out what their constraints are. Because these guys you are supporting, they'll face the same constraints. So why not resolve the problem now and work with these people to pull others? But, 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 but are you sure that government is addressing the core issues? Or is government it's tries. Feeding government us with the tries. Pain no, government tries. I've told you, for instance, they've done the road. But there are other things they are not addressing. For instance, part of the issues that we see is that the business environment, corruption, it's too many licenses. You know, if you move in those village roads, those local councils and sub counties have established their own taxes on produce. Now you want someone to take these things to the market, but it's unviable because he's being asked to pay a fee after every one kilometer. And these are ungazetted taxes. No, levies. They go down bribes. Hmm? So if you don't resolve that, it means there's a constraint. The team you speak for plays a very key role, especially in the development of this country. But do you think they are treated as a core sector in this country? Government says they are a core sector, but sometimes you don't get that. Sometimes you don't get that feeling. There's been efforts in recent times to prioritize them. You know, if you look at the Small Business Recovery Fund, for instance, if you look at the $636 billion that was put in UDP, if you look at the $100 billion that was put in the Uganda Microfinance Support Center, all this is an attempt to help them to grow. But it's not enough. It's one thing to put the money there mm. and getting them by cash, by hand. Mm. It's another thing. That's true. Most of them say and they never receive this. No, it's not free. This is also the issue. These are loans. So you don't just walk here and say, Man, say me, they are forgive me. No? Even they those who are qualified say they may yeah, have of course they are requirements. I mean, who determines whether they are qualified? It's the other people are giving their money. So if you are not given you are not given the money, then chances are you may not they may not have found you what. I mean it may be a good business, but may not have found you well. So, the, for us the point is government has tried, but there's a lot of work to be done. We need to simplify these processes. Yes, we need money to be safeguarded and all that, but safeguarding money too much, again, may not help us to achieve our goals. So what, will, what may help us achieve these goals? Government needs to strike a balance between giving money to the right groups, making sure that people go through a, a certain system of compliance and so on, and ensuring that money is available in time. If the crisis is now, and you take two or three years to process money, by the time it comes, it's useless. Mm. So, I think there's some work to be done in those areas. Okay. Mm. The financial year 2021-2022, 
Mm. We'll say we thank God it's coming to an end and the new one is coming. What is your anticipation? Our anticipation is that we shall continue on the road to recover, modest recovery. The minister said we are going to grow by 6.3 percent. I don't know, mm -hmm. around 6 percent or something like that. That is his thinking. I don't that know. That is his thinking. thinking. I don't think that is realistic. My thinking is we may grow in the ranges of 4, 4.5, and I think the central bank has also said something similar. So. You know, if you have grown at three point something percent or four something percent, there's no, there has to be a miracle mm -hmm. for us to grow by six percent in the next year. Okay. You know, all factors constant. So I think, for me, I would say four, four ish, four, four point five, four point six, four point seven. These kinds of ranges, I think, are fair. Okay. Times not seems to be our friend. What would be your Last words as we... Well, we want to thank the Ugandans who wake up every day to run their businesses. It's a tough situation. Uh, but you hang in there and try to seek for advice, try to seek for whatever support mechanisms exist, whether by government or by other private actors. We think it's very, very critical at this point. Thank you, Mr. Walgembe, for speaking to us on this You're coffee call. Of course, Joran Paulson called today mm -hmm. that is... That's been our area of subject. We hope next time on our coffee pot we'll be handling more or more similar the same concept. Over to you for business today. Fred Makubi there with John Walugembe, the president of the Federation of Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises. Now, high expectations are there for the next financial year, which takes us to our next report, which is the implementation of the parish development model, which is also a key pillar for the next financial year. The government of Uganda has been coming up with many programs to eradicate poverty, like the poverty alleviation program that was implemented in 1992 from the Development Bank and to the Intandiqua program, which was also introduced focusing on smallholder farmers and business people based on 6.4 billion shillings budget after uh, the poverty alleviation program being touted during the 1996 campaign. And many more have been there by the government. Now, the recent is the parish development model where each parish is to receive 100 million shillings and now a talk of the country. Samuel Kirimunda has the details to this one. For, we have people on ground who are going to monitor this program. We have the chairperson LOC2, chairperson, uh, the secretary who is a parish chief. We have the women council a chairperson at that level of the parish. We have somebody in charge of youths. We have somebody in charge of uh, elderly and the PWD. That is a committee to monitor this money. Then this money is put uh, in a circle. The circle has formed itself and they have opened up an account. When money comes, it goes straight to that account. And when somebody is withdrawing that money, there is a notification that straight goes to the RDC that this money has been removed. So when these people are removing the money, by all means the RDC is going to know. Uh, Parish C has removed such and such amount of money. But the RDC has a team also to work with. So they will follow up to know where is that money going, who is, being, who is going to be given this money. So that team, I think, will help us to monitor the money so that the money is not mishandled. And then um, about the, the, procedure. the procedure, we are, as ministers, we are going on ground to, 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 to pass on information to our people about the parish development model. And we are going to meet a team of uh, like 100 people. So when we inform them about this program, these people are also going to move down to the parishes because ministers, we are very few. But within these days, 
I think up to around the third, we would be done in the whole country. Some have already started. So when we finish, then the people whom we have given information, they will also go down to the parishes. Those are the parish chiefs. We have the community development officers. We have the local leaders at the district. They will all move down to the parishes and pass on the information. So then those people, people have already programmed themselves. The circles have already been made. In fact, many of them have been, accounts have been opened. They're just waiting. Then they will be educated on how to use the money, which type of projects they can do, because they have also to be informed of the projects that can be uh, invested in. What can you invest this money? Where can you invest this money? How much will you get? So these people will go around and educate our people so that they know how to use it and where to invest it. So that is the procedure that is going to be used for, yeah, people with these small pieces of land. We don't advise them to plant such uh, a crop because it is not a seasonal crop, it is an annual crop. Uh, and if it is not seasonal, you, you, you cannot use the small land to plant it. You have to leave it for those people who have big chunks of land so that they can plant the cane and then leave other land for production of food. Because if you just leave them in cane, then they will say, again, we don't have food. So it is advisable to leave such a crop to those who have big chunks of land. Moving on, now the rise of prices in the country has also seen a hike of cooking gas. The prices of cooking gas, which is also known as liquefied petroleum gas, have increased by an average of 30%. The cost to refill a 13 kilogram cylinder has risen by an average of 26,000 shillings, while refilling a 6 kilogram cylinder has surged from 46,000 in November to 68,000 shillings. Due to the Russian-Ukraine evasion, there has been a decrease in gas in production. OPEC, the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, reduced petroleum production by 10 million barrels, which caused reduction in supply of gas and hence the surge of prices of gas. Let's get the report. Ukraine produces over 24% of the natural resources. The denial of countries to purchase gas using the Russian currency forced most countries to resort to the Saudi Arab branch of gas. European countries decided to buy gas from Arab countries, thus increase in prices. While speaking with Mugwanga Edward Peter, the head of Spavision LPG says challenges of demand and supply caused the demand of petroleum products in general, which went high yet supply reduced as a result of COVID-19. The supply of petroleum products went down. A group called OPEC, which is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, reduced production by 10 million barrels. This reduced the supply in general. So, Yet the demand stayed the same. People stayed demanding for petroleum products, gas and oil. So in return, the prices had to go up. Uh, Pre-COVID, the amount of, of gas that was being produced, or petroleum products that were being produced, reduced. I would say they, they reduced because currently if 10 million barrels were cut from production, it means the balance has to sustain the current demand, which is not sustainable. The point would be the cost of logistics. Uh, the cost of oil went up globally and it, it increased the cost of transportation of different products and gas is included. So if you were to look at the price of a barrel right now, it went up. It had to increase the price of gas as well, both in transporting it and even in manufacturing it. 
it's got from crude oil and it's oil that went up in prices. Now Mim Tumba, Samuel Chirimonda, Business Today, Smart 24, Driving Business. Now Mim Tumba and Samuel Chirimonda. Well, with that, let's have a look at the recap of our top stories. Immigration launches a call center to improve its communication with the public and reduce corruption-related incidents. Kadaga's Border Borders Development Project turns into a battle over the distribution of border borders. The government launched the Uganda South Sudan Business Forum, which will raise awareness about the investment opportunities in both countries.